Hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Lynn mentioned that this is one of the last of the COP26 lead ups um, and it's one of the more fun ones, the ones that we're quite excited about. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit today about, hang on, I just want to make sure we're recording. Um, Oh, we are okay. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going to be talking a little bit about terrariums today. So, so we've got a couple of social scientists online. Um, we've got people from the global north and global south. Um, we're just going to ask, as general um, standard protocol, if we're going to keep our videos on, and um, we'll be engaging with our videos. If everyone else can just leave their videos off and mics off, um, and then towards the end, the second half is going to be questions. So maybe just start um, stewing on some questions along the way um, and then you can just pop your video on and your mic on if you'd like during the question session. Um, so as mentioned we've got some uh, social scientists as well as physical scientists here, um, Global North and Global South. We're just going to each take a minute to introduce ourselves and then we're going to be talking a bit as I mentioned about terrariums. So really we're looking at tools to engage society. I think that's where this con conversation is going to go. Um, how to link social sciences, physical sciences, and get a lot of what we're generating around climate change, and we're going to be talking so much about at COP26, um, into the population. How do we bridge that gap? Um, and yeah, educational tools are some interesting ways to go. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start. Maybe I'll introduce myself last. Um, I'll maybe just point you guys out, and then you can talk. Lena, do you want to maybe go first? Um, just talk a little bit about yourself, about a minute. Thanks. Thank you, um, Wendy. My, my name's Lena Dominelli. I'm a professor of uh, social work at the University of Stirling, and I'm uh, director of a program called Disaster Interventions and Humanitarian Aid. And I started working on disasters at Durham University. So um, I'm glad to be back uh, in my old... Um, Thanks. Oh, you just flipped on to mute. Are, are you good? Great. Thanks. Uh, Tarira, do you want to do you want to go next? Thanks, Lena. Uh, thank you, Wendy, and uh, good day, everyone. My name is Tarira Gwandu, and I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm a student with the Durham University, and I'm studying environmental engineering. I'm a soil scientist with interest in soil fertility and crop nutrition, and I'm currently working on building soil yield using water treatment residual, which is a byproduct of uh, potable uh, clean water treatment. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Tariro. Anna? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Anna Krzywoszyńska. Uh, I work at the University of Sheffield. I'm a social scientist and faculty research fellow at the Department of Geography and associate director at our Institute for Sustainable Food. And I am in love with soil. I've been in love with soil for about five years now. And uh, I just love that uh, feeling when you start talking about soul to people and they realize that it's the most wonderful and fascinating thing that they have never thought about. Uh, so there is something absolutely beautiful about soil and how it brings a lot of uh, socio-ecological and environmental and uh, economic concerns together and really provides a fertile <laughs> a fertile ground <laughs> for a lot of discussion as well as being central to our thinking about the future of land use and, and uh, climate and how we basically live on the planet in the future. So extremely topical for a COP and I'm delighted to be here today to talk more about how we can fall in love with soil through terrariums. Amazing, thank you Anna. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, my name is Wendy Stone. Um, I am a scientist at the, a physical scientist at the Water Institute at Stellenbosch University, which is right on the tip of Africa in South Africa. Um, I also started out as a microbiologist and then found myself in love with soils too. So I followed the same path and, and sort of got distracted by soils. Um, and yeah, so I've been working, I work in collaboration with Torero and Karen, who should have been hosting this, so we can mention her in her absence. Um, Karen is a professor in engineering at, at Durham University and is the one who actually stimulated all of this. I think she's the one that's most in love with soils. Um, and she, so she's unfortunately got COVID, so she can't be here. Um, yeah, and so I, I went from microbiology into soil sciences and we work a lot with waste remediation. So we look at putting wastes into nutrient poor soils or degraded soils. And, and what we're really finding is, is, I think more than one person now has mentioned that there's 
um, almost a lack of awareness of um, it's the, the social element is by far the most important in, in sort of matchmaking the wastes and the soils for, for healthy management of, of a city or um, towns, rural areas. Um, so I'm also very excited about this, um, excited about how engagement and, and we've been speaking a lot about a philosophy of care, um, uh, the idea of caring for soils um, as a microbiologist, soil as a living organism in a sense. Um, so we'll be talking about that. Um, okay, so, so the outline is going to be, I'm going to leap into a little bit of discussion about of what a terrarium looks like, how you build a terrarium, why we use a terrarium, um, and then the social scientists are going to leap in a little bit about education and using that to communicate, um, and uh, then we're going to talk a bit about Global North, Global South before starting questions. Um, so we had, Karen was the one who has diligently grown a terrarium or a, nourished a terrarium for, the, for a very long time and she can't be here now, so we don't have a terrarium on us. Um, but I'm just going to share my screen if I can and just show some pictures while I'm talking. Uh, okay, so I'm going to share this image. Can anybody just give me a shout if they can see it? Are you good? It's loading. Just give it a second. Yeah, here we are. Oh, how cute. Wendy, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, we're good. Thanks, Anna. Um, so uh, this is an image of a terrarium. So the idea behind a terrarium is what we're doing with a terrarium is we're creating a small ecosystem within a closed environment. Um, the beautiful thing about a terrarium is you've got a closed environment in terms of nutrients, in terms of gases, in terms of the nutrient cycling, but you've got an open energetic environment. So you've got the sunlight that comes in and continuously feeds the energy cycle within a terrarium. Um, as you can see with this particular terrarium, you've got different layers. You typically have a layer right at the bottom, which acts um, to, so if you're planting a pot, and we had dem demonstrations of this, but if you have a typical pot plant, you have drainage holes at the bottom. So you typically don't want plants to sit in water. So you have stones at the bottom and a layer of mesh at the bottom to trap water that runs through the soil so that you don't have your plants sitting in water. Then you've got a layer of soil and you basically just plant your plants. So typically what you're doing with a terrarium is because you want that nutrient and carbon um, and gas as well as water cycle to be happening, um, it's gonna be primarily plants that are very more tropical-ish plants that are quite happy and quite a moist in environment. You've got a lot of water cycling, so you're not going to put an aloe there. Something that Terrero and I would be much more familiar with is aloe and feinbos. They're not as happy in a closed environment like this, but something that's quite happy and with a lot of water. A couple of things about terrariums, for instance, it's, it is, so what's happening in here is there's an enormous amount of life. There's a lot of microbiology happening in the soil and you're creating a closed environment for that life to just continue. And it's a beautiful chance for children. Um, I've been doing it as an adult now, I've gotten quite addicted to this as well, is looking at the life happening inside of those and the life cycles happening. So you um, add a lot of, so small aphids and little things like that that can actually keep the mold clean. So they're eating away at the microbiology. Um, but particularly in terms of climate change, these are really interesting. And this is how it links to COP26 um, UN SDGs. So you've got, if you put a terrarium in direct sunlight, you're going to essentially fry that terrarium. So if you're gonna put a plant in direct sunlight, it would likely be quite happy in an open system. If you put a terrarium in direct sunlight, it's, you're gonna see those plants essentially um, dying of, of overheating and it's the gas cycle inside. So it's, it's an idea of what is happening in greenhouse, greenhouse gases and global warming. So, so you're looking at this terrarium as an example of the ecological system that we have outside. Um, within the soil, you can start actually, so as a scientist, this is a beautiful opportunity to plot nutrient cycles. It's incredible how long these survive as a closed system just adding a tiny bit of water. And another beautiful thing, so what we're doing, the work that we're doing is looking at understanding cities and we have this massive break in waste production and soil deprivation. So what you'll see is these plants start using the nutrients in the soil 
and a beautiful example of using a terrarium to start linking this to children and linking this to an understanding that there is a balance, um, an imbalance of nutrients in our cities is to go just putting an apple core or any sort of um, carbon rich organic matter that can decompose in there and watch the plants thrive um, as they access that carbon source, especially if they've been starved for, for a while. So it's a, a beautiful example of in a, in a very small system, linking it to children specifically, or even for ourselves, I find myself needing this um, because it's very hard to even communicate within municipalities and within farmers to um, kind of just the awareness that we've got waste produced in one side and nutrient poor soils in the other and how do we link these and when we link them what's happening there you watch that that apple core decompose and you might see some pathogens growing there. there's a little bit of risk to using wastes so it's just a perfect example of looking at ecological balance um, on many levels and watching the water precipitate for instance is just a gorgeous way of watching the water cycle for for kids so i'm not going to talk too much about the science because Anna, did you want to say something? I have so many questions. Okay, please ask questions. I wanted to, I wanted to go on to social sciences instead of physical sciences, but this is beautiful. Ask any questions you have. I just wanted to ask more because this is, I've, I've never done a terrarium. It reminds me of my aunt who had a terrarium, actually a huge, beautiful glass jar. And I remember being mesmerized by it and, and how come okay. I've never tried to build one is beyond me. I would definitely build one now. But I, I'm really interested in what you were saying about what the terrariums make visible. Uh, because mm -hmm. this is what I'm, I'm sure Elena will talk about this uh, soon. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we have in terms of engaging people with soil is that it is invisible and especially it's characterized by these slow processes which are very hard to observe and visualize. Um, so I just have questions. <laughs> I have questions about that, about the adding of soil life. So yes. how how so maybe maybe let's just stop at that. How how does the terrarium allow you to observe soil yeah. as a living entity or soil organisms even? Yeah. So so there are quite a few elements to that. Um, so soil is fascinating. It's it's again it's just one of the I think you mentioned it earlier. It's just one of the most beautiful examples of ecology that you can grapple with because it has all of these elements. So you've got the soil microbiology. So these are the tiniest organisms that are just like transferring the nitrogen, phosphates, carbon. Um, and, and so that soil microbiology needs food. So that's basically, it's invisible, but you can see it happening in the cycling of the nutrients. So as soon as the soil is starved and the plants start suffering, you know the microbes are suffering. Um, and then within the terrariums, you go up, up from a terrarium to, a, I think it's called a vivarium. So basically that just means different levels of life that you're adding. So many, most people, if they're just adding a, a, a terrarium, um, they will add, I can't remember the name of these like tiny little insects that go and graze. So what happens is you'll start having mold and fungi because it gets a little bit wet, the same thing that grows on your apple cores. And those insects go and graze on that because that might cause an imbalance. Um, and then some people are adding like little earthworms or they might be adding a frog or two or whatever the case may be, but then you need to feed that. So that's not as much of a closed system. Um, so that's basically, and then obviously you've got the plant life. Um, and what's beautiful about it is that you see as soon as there's an imbalance in any of that, the whole ecosystem crashes. So if you start getting mold, you basically need to sterilize and start the whole system again, which is, is quite indicative of the imbalance in human population at the moment, but that's the debate on another level. But yeah, um, I, I don't know if that answers your question fully. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, can I ask a question, which um, you, you talked about the terrarium as a closed system. And I assume that also means that there's um, no air coming in because you haven't got holes in the top of the jar lid um, yeah. to, to let them in. So how um, do you explain the oxygen that's created through the, um, the soil cycle to young people who are... And like curious about well how do they live in there when they're not getting any oxygen from the air hmm. so that's that's a beautiful question so so that that links to the climate change and and the the gas the gas cycles which really links to to um cop 26 in a sense so thank you for that question it's so so what you're looking at in there is you're looking at a gas cycle so so anyone who wants to go and google this and get a lot more information from much smarter people can do so but in a very simplified sense you're cycling gases and so you've got so so many plants in there that the oxygen is actually um in abundance so there the the sunlight is coming in 
Um, and the plants are photosynthesizing. So they're, they're using up the CO2 and producing oxygen. So they're doing exactly what we would want um, in a healthy ecosystem. So, so you've got more than enough. And so, so what, what one probably would do with a terrarium is open it every now and again, just to add a little bit of water. Um, any perfectly closed system is very unrealistic. But um, what's beautiful is with that very irregular, I think you're opening it maybe twice a month at most, um, the, the gas cycle in there is, is, is plenty for the ecosystem to keep running. Thank Any you. Thanks, Nina. Any other questions or shall we go on to... Okay, so it looks like we were... Yeah, could I ask we're... a question, please? Uh, sure. Who, who it, I have... It's Kaiko. Um, Kaiko, um, hi. Yeah. Uh, can you use this? Um, uh, for municipal sort of um, waste, can the sure. terrarium? Yo, that is actually a brilliant question. Um, yeah. Okay. So let me. I think what what we're going to do is we're going to have a full discussion afterwards. But I'm just going to very. I, I I've I've never seen it done, um, but that is brilliant. Um, so we work a lot with wastes. The thing about most municipal waste is you do need to worry a little bit, a little bit about toxins. So it depends where it's coming from. If you've got sort of compost heaps in municipality, you can definitely use it for something like this. But that's actually a wonderful thought in terms of just generating larger terrariums where we use it almost as a, as a model for the mm -hmm. toxins, even the cycling of the toxins within that system. Um, so that's something I hadn't thought about, but I, I love the idea. So thank you for that. All right, so, so shall we go on to Nina first and then Anna can talk a little bit about their thoughts around how this links to education and, and humans. Thank you, Wendy. What a wonderful start to um, the session. And, and um, hello, everyone who's joined us. It, it is an exciting, and I think we're all excited from our different positions about how we can take care of our soil. And I think for me, this is the most exciting thing because I've grown up, I'm the uh, daughter of a farmer's daughter. <laughs> and um, she, she instilled the love of the land and soil and um, the trees and everything. So I always tend to think of nature and gardens together. And um, we've invented a new term for uh, the physical scientists to make note. We've invented the term called eco-grief to talk about how we miss nature and being able to engage as we would have done pre-COVID because of all the restrictions on us. Although some people took it as an opportunity to learn about gardens and soils. But um, what I'm gonna talk about now is not that element, much as I could kind of talk about the um, wonderful history that I have of gardening and getting my mom got my son to love it as well, who was a, a, a scientist and really um, got involved in um, the science of um, looking at um, all the chemicals that go into soils. But I'm going to um, focus on really the way in which um, um, we treat the soil as a given, and I'm going to relate to some of the work that um, I have done in terms of um, the engagement of children, by which I mean I'm using the UN definition of children, which is anyone under 18, but really I'm talking about children, young people, and adolescents, because they're actually crucial to the future, one. And two, they are also the ones that have had to live with um, the way in which soils have been um, subjected to um, things that actually are not um, the way that they should be done because we're um, eliminating a lot of the wonderful things that um, soils provide for us. So I'm gonna refer to two pieces of research that I have done with young people, especially here in Scotland, um, because although a lot of what I'm saying builds on what Durham and particularly Karen Johnson and her team have done, it's actually um, wider than that. And I thought when I moved to Scotland, 
um, we really need to find out what's um, being done. Now, I was going to share a slide with you, but for some reason or other, I'm trying to find my slide, but it seems to have gone AWOL and I get something else instead, which is uh, very frustrating. So I shall just talk, which is okay, because I like talking anyway. <laughs> so um, I'm going to um, do that and um, if the thing does decide to come back, then I will switch over. But at the moment, it hasn't done that. So um, I called my talk Healthy Soils, Climate Change, Climate Risk, and Young People, because I think we have to think about all of those things together from a social science perspective, where we're looking at social behavior, societal behavior, and individual behavior and how the, the, the three things come together um, when we're trying to do something about climate change. And I'm like the rest of the team here today, we're all very committed to getting the most enormous reductions, um, really sticking to that 1.5 degree centigrade reduction in um, temperature rises, which we are not meeting at the moment. And my hope for COP26, and I will be there representing social work um, and talking about some of the things I'm talking about today. Um, but um, it really is quite concerning that we have, at least as far as we know, some of the major emitters of uh, greenhouse gases and carbon into the atmosphere, the soils and the water, because this cycle that um, Wendy was talking about affects all of those three elements. And we live in those three elements as people and societies are predicated on the basis that we can just reach out and get clean air and clean soil and clean water whenever we want it. So it comes as a shock to most people to find out we actually cannot make those assumptions anymore, which certainly you could make in my youth when I grew up in rivers in, in Canada, um, you could just go and jump into the river and you never worried about pollution and toxic materials coming down because um, water uh, sources were contaminated with toxins and uh, a lot of the pesticides and herbicides from the nearby farms were going into the river. In fact, we were uh, given a, a, a warning by the health agency where we lived um, when a deer fell into the water and started decaying it. And we weren't allowed to drink the water and that until it was um, boiled. And my dad said, ha, huh, he thinks we have to sit here until it decomposes. That could take forever. I'm going to go and I'm going to deal with it. So he went down to where the deer was dead, picked it up, took it out, buried it somewhere far from the river. And um, he said, now you guys can drink the water without having to worry about it because we didn't like boiled water because it didn't taste good because the oxygen was missing from it. So we found out in our current research, and I, I have two pieces of research I'm doing and I'll refer them to them, is that young people in Scotland, and this includes children, adolescents and young people, and I might refer to them all as children just for the sake of brevity, but they do not know that there is a link between soil health and climate change. And that, um, as Karen likes to say, um, a healthy soil produces a healthy nation. And it's uh, a quote from um, uh, Frank Delano Roosevelt of the New Deal fame. And we know from some of the research that I've done that there are some areas of the world that are more at risk of climate change and climate risk itself. And these are uh, young people, children, adolescents, and young people in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And we have wonderful maps that will show these to you. We've actually written um, material which has been publicized, but not published yet because we're in the, uh, I think we're in the fifth month of this particular project, which is really run by UNICEF. Um, and it shows that extreme weather events, especially floods and droughts, are um, happening in Sub-Saharan Africa and East Asia more than anywhere else. And so more children there are at risk than elsewhere, proportionately more. 
So if we're building up the soil structure, which maybe we should have emphasized a little bit more in the introduction that if you improve soil structure, you do two things as I understand it. And I'm sure the physical scientists will correct me if I get science wrong, but the soil structure improves so that it holds water better, which is great because um, if you're in a drought situation and the water is held better, it means that your plants will get water for longer. If you're in a flood situation, so it's a bit of a win-win. If you're in a flood situation, it'll hold the water for longer. So you might be able to um, deter the flooding a little bit, which might give you enough time to um, put other mit mitigation strategies in place, like putting up sandbags. And this might be particularly important if you have vulnerable infrastructures like bridges and you suddenly need to protect them because you realize they're weak. Um, and the force of the water might cause them to fall. So I think that's a really important lesson. And this is about the kinds of things that educating young people um, in relation to soil and climate change um, might do. And the other thing that we have to be aware of now, there is a, um, uh, an equation that physical scientists really like to use a lot, um, which is that risk is equal to hazard times exposure times vulnerability. And never in the time I have been involved in disasters, which goes back to 2004, um, have I heard anyone mention that a hazard, if we're not looking after it, is soil degradation. And I think we have to start thinking about that because if the soil is degraded, it will have an impact on the air, the soil and the water that young people grow up with um, and in. And um, so I think we need to start looking at that equation and start saying, well, where do we put ha a hazard and soil into this equation so that it becomes a prime concern of people and not just a taken for granted? You know, well, the soil's always there, the soil's firm under my feet, none of which is true. It's a living organism, as Wendy so aptly said. And what we know from our um, UNICEF research is that one billion, that's one eighth of the world's children, or more than, than one eighth, because there's not quite eight billion people on the earth and children are only um, about half of that. But one billion children are exposed to four climate-related hazards. That includes storm surges, cyclones, hurricanes, droughts, forest fires, floods. Um, and in 2020, 600 million of these one billion children were exposed to what are called vector-borne diseases, which are uh, usually borne by water or rely on water in some way. So, for example, malaria relies on stagnant water for the larva to breed and grow and become mosquitoes, the Anopheles mosquito. Um, we also know that 920 million, that's nearly a billion children are exposed to water scarcity. And we know that water scarcity leads to armed conflict. It has done this in Central Asia so far. And I don't know how many of you know that the Syrian war was started not because of the Arab Spring, but because one million people from the south um, eastern, is it south? No, the southwestern part of Syria had a drought for several years, didn't have enough water for their crops. So they upped sticks and went to southeastern Syria where they had lots of water. And all of a sudden, a million people descended on this one small area. And yes, struggles began over scarcity of water. And then it got bigger and then it got involved in um, the um, Arab Spring as well. But it started off as a, an issue about water scarcity. So it's really important that we understand these connections because if we're going to develop a safer, cleaner earth that is sticking to the 1.5 degrees C ambition, um, of uh, climate warming, then we need to do a lot in kind of resolving resource scarcity and helping people acquire what they need. They're not asking for a lot of water, just enough to 
grow their crops so that they can feed themselves and their children and have a decent life. Um, so I think that if we can rebuild the soil, because it also stores carbon as well as hold back water, um, it would help mitigate the risks associated with the hazards of potential conflict that people will um, engage in because they need to survive um, with their families and um, their society and their culture. Those are all important elements and they're all linked to this eco grief. You lose those, you lose your sense of identity and who you are. And that is very fundamental to us as people. The other thing that I think we need to uh, remember is that poverty underpins vulnerability. And there are 1.2 billion children that are poor in the world today, and 360 million of them live in extreme poverty, absolute poverty, where they lack basic necessities to wa water, sanitation, hygiene, also known as wash in disaster circles, um, education, nutrition, health, and housing. And in the um, global south, this includes one in seven children um, who are having to um, deal with this. And so improving the soil can reduce poverty. Why? Because it enables people to grow crops for food and income generation. And those are the two elements of security that actually enable people to survive and live with others in peace without arguing um, over resources. The other thing that I think is really important, and this came out in all of my research, including the one which I did with school children in, in Scotland, where um, young people and children, adolescents have ideas about what they want to do about reducing climate change. And they also argue that no one listens to them and that they need effective representation and intervention um, capabilities if they are to exercise their agency, which they do have. And we'll come back to that point in a minute. But the way society is currently organized, it's mainly adults who speak on behalf of children, uh, mainly in the adult role of providing for children and protecting them so that they can grow to um, good citizens and nice adults that people, other people can relate to. Um, so that is um, a critique of young people who have said, we have no space, nowhere to go to sort of say, we are children, we want this to be done by society and we want to say what we want to be done, not adults telling you what we, they think we want you to do. And so from that point of view, then education becomes really, really important because in order to exercise agency, you need to have information at your disposal, knowledge and skills. You have to know how to engage with people who are not going to agree with you and do so in a diplomatic or what I prefer to say, a thoughtful, considered way. And if you want an example par excellence, I cannot think of anyone better than Greta Thunberg, who is, uh, exemplifies this for me. She's learned the science. She knows how to articulate and communicate her message. She knows how to inspire other people to act. And she's done this pretty much on her own. So just think, if people nurtured the Greta Thunbergs of this world, how much better we would be able to engage in climate change. And I do have to just add as an aside, I don't know if she'd like me to be saying this, but she did uh, launch our first report on the UNICEF project. And she spent a lot of time not, not commenting on the report we wrote with UNICEF, but on taking to task the appalling record that Boris Johnson and his government have on climate change. So she's demonstrated this agency and the capacity to do it and be well grounded in evidence, which she keeps saying, I want the evidence. You're telling me this, but what's the evidence for it? Which is really quite um, important. The other thing that I think our education has to cover because- Carolina, 
I just want to pass yeah. in and just go, um, we just need a couple of minutes for Anna and Tariro as well. I just want to know sort of how long still? Um, I've only got another two points. Okay, fantastic. Thank so, you so yeah. much. I want to make sure everyone That's has a time to hop in. Thanks. Yeah, so it's mainly about educating young people about the structural, the cultural, the institutional and geographical factors, as well as the individual ones that come to um, impact on their experiences, the lived experiences of climate change. Um, and to be aware that adultism is about the way in which adults try to construct children's views in their own image rather than letting the children speak for themselves. So I want to conclude by saying actually children Adolescents and young people can become powerful change agents if we treat them and engage them as valued partners in creating new sustainable futures. And we know this from examples of where they've been involved in working with the soil, but not in a rebuilding it capacity, like in Bangladesh, where they've been planting mangrove trees to mitigate flood risk and soil erosion. So the plea is adults, Change your way of responding to children. Um, don't carry out your protector and provider roles in ways that silence them, but encourage them and give them the space to say and the opportunities and resources to say what they need to say about how they want to change the world so that the future reflects them and their interests and needs. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lena. Um, so I think before we leap onto any questions, I, and I probably have a lot to add to that. So Anna, do you want to go for it? Yes, I mean, that was a, an amazing set of points. Thank you so much, Lina. What I would uh, add maybe is a rather different perspective. So coming back to our focus in the session, which is with terrariums, I think that uh, the um, systemic issues that Lina was uh, describing can be very overwhelming. And the, the work of soil improvement, soil regeneration, these um, are uh, issues that come into play, again, on a systemic and collective level, very often more than they come on an individual level, especially when we're talking about climate change related soil degradation, which is often not um, only human driven, but also basically climate change driven. So yes, human driven, but not, not in a direct way. Therefore, it can be very hard to get your hands on <laughs> soil in order to improve it. And actually, I really wanted to hear more from um, our colleague in Zimbabwe about um, how she thinks, um, whether she thinks that there is a similar disconnect amongst the Zimbabwean youth uh, and young people in terms of uh, understanding the importance of soil or the relationship with soil as there is here in the UK and other Western countries. Uh, because that disconnect, we tend to think, has to do with uh, a sort of transition of uh, societies from an agrarian base to a more industrial base, but that's not necessarily true. Uh, this is something that is coming out from my research with uh, farmers. Having an experience of uh, soil uh, work does not necessarily make you a soil steward. If it did, then we wouldn't be in the situation that we are today. Uh, what shapes our relationship with soil is how we collectively understand our relationship to the environment. So what are the ethics that drive us to take care or not to exploit the environment? And this is, I think, where the terrariums are so beautiful in that they really show the care, like you were saying, Wendy, in your description of the various disruptions that you can observe within the terrarium ecosystem, the ease with which things spin out of balance. I think this is a very powerful message that is very hard to observe on a full ecosystem scale um, because of the temporality and the scale involved. But the terrariums really drive that point home. But um, that the environment is something that, that doesn't exist independently of us. It, it is something that we are entangled with and that our actions impact on and that we benefit from. And therefore, we're not in the relationship of use and user or resource and user. We're in the relationship of codependence and care. And that means that we have to behave carefully, which means actually also paying attention 
And what does it mean to pay attention to the environment and to our impact on the environment is a, a very big question if you discuss it in, in these kind of grand narrative uh, terms. But if you are able to show it in a simple example of how a core of an apple throws the nutrient cycle out of whack because there is just too much to process, um, then and the wrong type of gases is generated, etc. Then you know it becomes an extremely powerful and potent method. So that would be all from me, actually. But I really would like to hear from our colleague in Zimbabwe if she's still with us. Did we lose her? Wendy, you're, you're muted. Uh, sorry, sorry, we've lost her. Unfortunately, I did text her, um, but the text is not going through, so they may have lost internet altogether. Um, so maybe I'll just leap in on her behalf. Yes, I lost the internet connection. Oh. Did you also? Okay, yeah, so I can describe some of their research because we work together. I'm really hoping, so. well, I'll ask Anna and Lena to just watch if she come back, comes back on and then just interrupt me so she can slide in. Um, just to link to all of this, um, I, I was, uh, so, so Karen has done work in Zimbabwe, I think it is. Um, just to mention what you were saying, Anna, to emphasize what you were saying, um, she did work, I think, with Europeans as well as Southern African children. Um, and I think their awareness of the soul was quite similar. It was, it was low in both cases. They, they were asking specifically around understanding that soil is living and some of these scientific philosophies. Um, and as you mentioned, just, just because people are farmers doesn't mean they under, understand necessarily what is happening in the soil. And, and I mean, I can even testify to that until I met soil scientists, I was walking as a microbiologist, I wasn't even really noticing the soil. Um, so I love your point about the fact that these kind of tools to make children aware could be so very powerful. Um, and so, so if you, and, and one of the, one of the, the, important parts if you're looking from the global south and Lena mentioned how much poverty matters. Um, many of these farmers, for instance, even if they were to understand care of the soil, um, productivity in poverty outweighs. It doesn't matter how beautiful the soil seems or how, how um, even sort of long-term ideas of, of um, a better soil, long-term soil cycle, if I'm hungry tomorrow, that is the, the driving force. And what's wonderful about tools like this is that at least, as, as Anna mentioned, just raises perception and raises awareness so that those are more balanced in their value, as opposed to I'm hungry tomorrow and I don't, I'm not even aware of, of the, the other end of that balance scale, I guess. Um, and and I, I think maybe also to just leap onto what Lena was saying, I've read so many articles about sort of um, the, the potential for war around water, for instance. Um, and it's similar around soil and resource. Um, what's beautiful, I think, and what gives me so much hope is I recently read an article that proposed the other end, again, the other end of that scale. Um, and that's that in, in South Africa, as apartheid was um, uh, ended and our government collaborated, the first collaborations that our country went into were around better management of water resources. So, so what Anna was saying, as soon as you start paying attention and there's a collaborative soul in the environment, it can actually become an incredible stimulant for sort of driving vision, driving collaboration, driving better ideas as to how to manage our society in future. So it, is, it has this potential to stimulate war, especially in the global south where there's so much um, limitation around, say, um, water or nu nutrient-rich soils. However, it also has the potential to really stimulate collaboration. Um, so, so it's, and, and I think this point of like tapping into care with children, tapping into a sense of this matters to me, it's beautiful. Um, I'm sort of getting excited about it might be the, the thing that sort of flips between those two balances or one of the elements. Um, so I am, I'm disappointed to say, I don't think Taria is on, right? Looks like we're not going to get her comments. Um, yeah, so maybe we can open to the floor. One or two people messaged and said they had to leave. Um, yeah, uh, maybe we can open to the floor. Is, does anyone have questions? Otherwise, I have a couple for Anna and um, Lena, but let's maybe see the floor does first. Okay, I don't see anything from the floor. Um, 
Yeah, so so I don't know if, if I, Anna or Lina, I don't know if either of you want to talk a little bit about specifically how um, you see this linking to some of the sustainable development goals in terms of city management, in terms of soil management. Um, uh, Lena, maybe some of some of your work specifically, you mentioned the kids in Scotland. Um, yeah, just linking it to COP26. Uh, yeah, we're, we're hoping to, but before I answer that question, I lost connection again, so I'm not quite sure of everything you said, but when you raised that issue of uh, soils being positive, connectors between people. I also wanted to add, because um, I didn't say this before, is that um, soil is what we base our identity on, the land. Um, seeing ourselves as people of the land, and there are a lot of Indigenous people, which we haven't mentioned, so I just thought because um, Tiaro, Tiaro is not here um, yet, um, is that um, they do remind us that their sense of identity, who they are, is linked to the land and why they're so, they have invested so much in being protectors and custodians of the earth on behalf of all of us. So I just wanted to say that. But in terms of the SDGs and uh, young people, yeah, there are some that are really relevant to them. They're going to come and talk about actually what um, uh, Tarero was going to talk about, which is uh, answering the question, what can we learn from the experiences of people? They're basically based in Africa, um, three young people based in Africa, and they're going to have a dialogue with them. This is on the 5th of November, which is Youth Day in COP26. And you can actually, um, you should be able to link up with um, the U YouTube kind of versions of it. I'm trying to get the Earls so that I can send them around to people. And if I get them, I will distribute them to Lynn so that she can send them to this group. But um, they're going to be talking about reciprocated learning, which is about what can we learn from the global south when we live in the global north? And what can people in the global south learn from us because our experiences are so different? So it's kind of like looking for unity together, um, knowing that we're in different places because of historical reasons, colonialism, and so on. So that'll be really, really interesting. And that's at, um, from 9 to 10.30 in the morning on the 5th. I can give you the time, but not um, the Earl. Um, but the other SDGs that are relevant to them are number one, ending poverty. Number two, ending hunger. Number three, health. Because, of course, they're all interlinked. Number Oh no. <laughs> I'm missing or <laughs> um, I'll give it a minute otherwise. Um, okay, so I don't know, I'm just gonna leap in and continue that. I think so so we recently just wrote a paper. Um please leap in if you have thoughts on this but I think what's what what you'll pick up from what Lena was going to say is that basically I think we 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 realize that soil sorry my internet is also depends almost every single SDG there's 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 not a single SDG DG that it doesn't underpin so that's that stimulates this idea that that creating these little mini ecosystems means we're learning about something that underpins every single priority that, that COP26 is, is looking at. Um, and we'll, a little bit about health, you would see it in a terrarium, um, I'm just about to go on to the SDG around health. Um, many of our soils, because we've got this massive imbalance in the science, you've got soils being stripped by irresponsible farming. Oh, you're back, Lena, all yours. <laughs> Are you back? Sorry, you're on mute, I think. You're just it muted itself, yeah. Sorry about that. I, I lost connection for some reason. It keeps going off and on. But um, I was making the connection because I don't have time to go through all the 17 uh, social development goals, is that 6 to 17, 17 is about partnership, which we're trying to develop through that session on the 5th of November. Um, but the others are all about clean air, clean water, uh, agriculture, fishing, um, sustainable urban development, 
um, and all of those kind of things. So they're about the infrastructure and the physical environment, and it covers air, soil, and uh, water. So I think that's really important for us. Can you hear me or have I disappeared again? Okay. No, you're perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So those are what I would say about the SDGs and maybe Anna has other things to say as well. You have other thoughts, Anna? Yes, I was thinking about the relationship between this collective and individual agency again. When we're talking about the SDGs, like you summarized, Wendy, then there are very good kind of infographics now out in papers which really show how healthy cells underpin the delivery of a lot of the SDGs. I mean, obviously, because uh, if we think about uh, our life on the planet, what sustains us on the terrestrial globe, apart from the oceans and even partly related to the oceans, mm -hmm. is, a, is a functioning and healthy soil. So obviously having that as the basis is an inescapable truth for our species and for our civilizations and our cultures and our individual well-being. But we have always this uh, struggle around soil conservation or around soil improvement or around soil management in that it is simultaneously soil is a public good. Everything that happens in soils affects everybody else, but it is also the basis of our modern economy, which is based on private ownership of land. And especially if we're discussing these issues in the context of uh, post-colonial nations, there we are really coming you know, against some very hard ingrained privilege in terms of land ownership, uh, which has massive ecological and social consequences. Um, so there is always that tension in uh, talking about improving soils and soil regeneration between what we know that we need to do collectively and the fact that land is held as a private good, as a private asset. And so that's where you have these struggles between top down or collective desires, <laughs> objectives and individual um, and individual uh, interests based on extraction. And I was thinking actually, is there, so to come back to our terrariums, we, we, we were discussing the terrariums mainly in the context of an individual home or an individual person, an individual owner. Um, could, is, there, is there a point to building a classroom size <laughs> terrariums or terrariums that are big enough for a whole classroom to engage with, uh, which are a bit bigger, and in which you know somebody is given the role of the polluter or the extractor, and they do things that unsettle, and other people are given the role of the caretaker and the improver, and they try to undo. But the, the damage that is being done in a different bit of the terrarium. Would that work on this? Could we make bigger terrariums that are more complex? I mean, this is such a beautiful idea. I just had a sort of private chat in the corner here with, I think his name is, this as a, a tool for even engaging with municipalities, um, looking at larger scale terrariums that evidence pollutants. Um, and I'm loving just simply, I was so struck with you said, so there's that the tragedy of the commons, the sense that as soon as there's communal management of something, it gets very difficult. Um, but privatization is also challenging. Um, and just like even in a school going, what happens if you have one large scale terrarium that's given to certain kids and then another one where they're communally managing? I, I mean, there probably are people out doing things, but it's a wonderful idea um, and just Okay, contribution here. Yeah, thank you. Alina, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Um, sorry, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry, you're on mute. To write, I tried to write in the chat. I keep going in and out, so I missed most oh, of what you said, um, okay. including the question. That's not a problem at all. So we were, we were just looking at larger scale terrariums in the classroom for communal management, but that's probably a, a sign because we are three minutes away from three o'clock or two o'clock your side, I think. 
Um, so I think that's everything. I don't know if there's any final question from the audience, if anyone wanted to say anything, otherwise we will um, say a very happy greeting. Will an earthworm survive in the terrarium? They will one day. Sorry? Where? An earthworm. I could drop an earthworm into my terrarium and it will like, live, right? I don't know if it's the accent, but I don't know what you're... Oh, an earthworm. Yes, yes. So, okay, well, it depends how... Some, you might need to just do a bit of Googling on, on gas exchange and how large... You might need larger airspace for more oxygen, but I think you could, yeah, try it and see. Just watch how happy they are and just open it if they need a bit more air. Um, but yeah. Okay, I think we're going to wrap it up. Thank you, everybody. Um, it was such a great conversation. It was wonderful to be here. Um, yeah, and if anyone has questions, please email any one of us. I'll maybe just drop the email in the chat box and there'll be a recording. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Katie. Um, Thank you, everyone. And thanks, I'm everyone. off to buy a big jar. Yes, right. <laughs> Go build terrariums. <laughs> Bye.